Welcome to the Project Endure Podcast, the place where we talk about life, endurance, persistence, perspective, and so much more. I'm Joe Rinaldi, and I'll be your host. Let's jump in. Before we get started, let me ask you a question. Have you ever noticed that what you wear has the power to change how you feel? Project Endure Apparel is designed to remind you that easy won't make you stronger and that growth is an uncomfortable choice that we all have the privilege to make every day. Look good, feel good, and perform good. Head to the link in the show notes to shop Project Endure Apparel and keep on doing hard things. Now, let's get to the episode. Welcome back to the Project Tinder podcast, episode 88. We have myself, Joe Rinaldi, and we have a very, very special guest in New Jersey, Vin Kennedy. Vin, how are you? Good, Joe. Thanks for having me. I appreciate your time. Of course, I appreciate your time as well. Uh, You are in my home state of New Jersey. And before we hit record, I said, where are you? You said Monmouth County. And then you paused and you said Central Jersey. Yeah. So let's, let's settle this, you know. There's Southern New Jersey. There's Northern New Jersey. Does Central Jersey actually exist? Personally, I think so. I actually, I went to Ramapo College my freshman year, and that was the first I've heard of this. Nowhere's land basically is uh, Central Jersey. But personally, I think so, because I think of the beaches south and then, you know, Bergen County up north. So if, if you had to claim allegiance to north or south, let's just say there was a civil war within the state of New Jersey that broke out. You got to go north or south. What do you pick? it's tough. I got to go with the beach. I got to go with South. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Well, now that, now that that's out of the way, Ben, why don't you, uh, why don't you tell me and the audience a little bit about who you are and we'll dive in from there. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Vin Kennedy. I'm from New Jersey. Um, I would just say at, at the moment, an entrepreneur, uh, I was a police officer for three years, took a change in career, uh, hopped into mortgage loans. So into sales. And then from there, I'm now franchising a gym and, and just really big in the, the self self improvement, self growth, uh, type space. Mm. What made you pick law enforcement to begin with? My dad was actually a police officer. And I was also one of those kids that did not do well in school. And it was one of those where, you know, I'll never sit at a desk and you kind of give yourself the narrative that might ultimately not even be true. Mm. That's interesting. Were there other things that you told yourself about yourself that you now see might not have been actually the case? Absolutely. Um, I was always a poor runner and just ran two marathons in seven months. And it's I I use the physical to kind of unlock the mental. All right. We gotta we're gonna unpack that. We're gonna keep moving forward, but I'm parking that right now. We're gonna come back to that. Uh you left law enforcement. What was the deal there? What why'd you leave? So I was in Jersey City, so again, North Jersey. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, just seeing a lot, uh, I grew up in Middletown, so it's a very, I would say I grew up in a bubble and I went to Jersey city and saw a lot of craziness for lack of a better term. Um, and I just wasn't happy. I didn't feel fulfilled. It was, it was a tough place to do the right thing. And I think that's never a good position to be in. Um, and even with that, I, I just, Seeing a lot of things, I was getting hardened as a person, and uh, I'm very family oriented, very soft. And there was actually dive right into it. My one of my last weeks of work, there were two homicides uh, a block up from me, and I'm finding myself at the hospital. The doctors are talking to the family, and I'm getting stressed out and annoyed because the family is running off and you know hysteric. And now I'm getting annoyed at the family. Meanwhile, they just lost their family member. And I'm annoyed because I want to go home on time. And I'm sitting here like, this is not who I am or, or how any of this should go. Um, so then actually, so that was just a Monday, Wednesday. I think like Friday, I had a wake for a, a close friend's father. And everybody, everybody's crying. Everybody's, you know, obviously just upset. And I, I again, I was in that like, you know, what time am I going home? Like how much time until I could go home and go eat? And I'm like, this is not good. So I had a long chat with my mom that night and it kind of really brought light that I needed a change or I didn't like the path that I was headed down. 
that concept of hardening is something that uh, I haven't talked about on this podcast, but I, I think is something that most people can relate to. And I'm curious if you dove more into that topic of hardening, would you say that's similar to being apathetic or just, you know, losing that sense of care for, for people and things around you? Yeah, totally. That's, I think that that hits it right on the head. Um, it's, it's just a disconnect. How, how do you, I mean, if you were to stay in law enforcement or cause, cause there are plenty of people who do, who probably have that same sense of awareness or that same moment of, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm getting hardened and they stay. Yeah. Is there anything looking back you could have done that would have prolonged maybe the, the softness that you live with? Probably going, which was in future plans going and being a drill instructor in the academy. I think would have been my best alternative there. Yeah. And so, so you pivot mortgage loans. Yeah. Uh, sales is a tough space to be in. Yeah. And you chose an interesting time. I'm sure not on purpose uh, with the pandemic to be in sales from, for mortgages. Uh, how, how has that been? And, and what have you learned? So a lot of ups and downs. Um, I, it's, it's entrepreneurship. So it's betting on yourself. Um, it was kind of my gateway into entrepreneurship. Um, basically what happened was I knew I didn't want to be a police officer. I was one of these people, I'm very optimistic. So I was willing to do almost anything else. Uh, me and a buddy, were going to start a clothing brand in Texas on a whim. I know nothing about clothes. Like I wear people that see my social media stuff, I'm sure could attest. I wear generically the same clothes, the same, same brands. Um, but yeah, so I started reading a ton and everything I'm sure, you know, and that you see it in the self growth space where it's like real estate investing and real estate is, is the hack. That's the way in, that's the way to make money. And you can kind of build it up from there. Um, knew nothing about real estate. So just asking questions, realizing my cousin does mortgages, um, and was involved in, in being a loan officer. I was like, Hey, you know, any openings? And he was like, yeah, come on board. He, uh, he's been saying it for a while just because I <clears throat> enjoy being personal and connecting um, that it would be a good fit for me. And uh, luckily it was. And so was it difficult to transition there from law enforcement and then also having it, you know, the pandemic on top of that? Yeah. So basically, luckily rates were very low. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> Luckily, rates were very low. So that was definitely on my side. Um, so at the same time that it was difficult because of everything being shut down and, and things not being as open as as normal, um, that was a big benefit. So with that, I just kind of leveraged social media. Um, mm -hmm. I randomly, I would say, even six months before that, I just started really posting on social media for no reason at all. Um, just quotes and, and books. And then it kind of helped me when I did transfer into real estate because I already kind of had that, you know, I feel like a lot of people were hesitant at first to post and I already kind of had that out of the way. Um, but I, I would say the biggest scare that obviously most people would realize is the, you know, you go from guaranteed six figures with a pension to not like literally nothing. Like it's a hundred percent commission. And, you know, I had a lot of people telling me I was making the wrong move. Um, and it, it kind of it luckily worked out. Yeah. So, all right, we're going to pause here for a sec because I'm going to ask some questions that I believe will lead us further down this path. But before we get there, you host your own podcast. I host this podcast and it's very different being on one side of the microphone versus the other. Um, I'm sure you're very used to, to asking the questions as opposed to answering them. Right. And I'm curious for you, this is a new one I'm trying out. What's the hardest question that you've ever been asked? And you might need to take a pause and think about that for a second because it's it's a tough question. And I'm not sure I even have an answer for myself. Yeah, um, that's a, a really good question. And it, it's funny because I've actually been, I always listen to a lot of your episodes, but I've been really listening to a ton because I'm like, you're right. Like I've never been on this side of it. Um, I would just say at the same time as the questions that get vulnerable are tough, I think they're also the best questions. So I would say really anything that kind of, you know, digs into the, the deep answers. Okay. So I'm hoping we'll do that here. I'm going to throw one at you off the top of my mind here. What's your biggest insecurity? 
biggest insecurity? Um, I would, I would say the self narratives that I've kind of told myself growing up and then that, you know, could sometimes stay attached to you, uh, as you grow. So like I even mentioned one right off the bat, like it, I wasn't a good student. Um, it just very, I lack confidence at times. Um, and it's, yeah, I really say it just, it kind of comes from the self-talk because we all have that voice that plays devil's ad advocate and, you know, some, some of us could kind of mute that voice, but it, it takes work. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I'm sure people can relate to that. So let's get into the usual questions. First one, what's the hardest thing that you've ever had to handle? So a circumstance that you didn't get to choose for yourself. Yeah. So this one, again, I listen to a lot of your episodes. This one's one I've been thinking about and I would just say it's tough because I, I've, I've lost a lot of people at a young age. So it's, it's tough to like really say one. I would definitely mm -hmm. say though, that comes to my forefront is I lost my uncle to suicide in 2017. But the thing with that is three years prior, I lost my aunt to cancer. Same. They were married. So now mm -hmm. my cousins were left parentless. My one cousin was 18 left parentless. My other cousin was 20. I want to say early twenties. So that, and then of course, as you grow and develop, there's people get sick. And then my mom got cancer a couple of years later, she beat it, but it was just, you know, we need the tough things because I don't, I don't think without most of them, even I would have made it as many days as I did as a Jersey city cop. I think it, it's really, I would definitely say that. And then the other one would be when I was a sophomore in high school, I battled, um, pretty severe anxiety and depression leaving me not I did not leave my room for I would say five months besides doctor visits and there yeah there's a ton to unpack there but um that was another one and again I mean of course you could say I did cause it to myself to a degree but at the same time it's you know it's it's the mind and it's it's a powerful thing let's talk about that first yeah. and how, how did that all start what was the first day where you spent in your room yeah so really it was uh I, it, I can't even attribute it to one thing it was just a ton my body was growing um so obviously hormones had a lot to do with it and just anxiety um and i think i just let it spiral to a place that you know like i said i live in this bubble of middletown and you know everything was like perfect childhood growing up and you, you kind of you hit some adversity and it's just like, what is this? And I didn't, didn't know how to handle it. So I, I, you know, even the podcast name of mine is keep going. And it's for that reason, because like the only time you actually can fail is when you quit. And, and for mm -hmm. those five months is what I look at it as, is like, I quit on myself. I quit on, on everything. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, I would say it was, I just remember watching the Knicks. Mello was on the Knicks. It's literally the only thing I really remember. I guess we try and block it out. As a Knicks fan, I certainly blocked out the mellow days. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I was a big, I was a big Amari Stoudemire fan, and yeah, it all went downhill when they brought Mellow in. But anyway, I'm curious, looking back, if there's part of you that feels like you needed those five months to become the person that you are today. Yeah, totally. Um, and I think from there, it was just, it, it, it's kind of why I live in the manner I live in today. Um, it's just a testament of like, just persevering and resilience. So you, you talk a lot about that through your podcasts on social media, I'm sure through, you know, everyday conversations that you have, you know, what is the hardest part about living it out for you these days? Yeah. Uh, again, I mean, it's, you know what, honestly, I think social media, it's the toughest thing to do is to not compare, but I think it's the comparison game. Um, I think that's where sometimes it's easy to get deterred, uh, just because you see people at level a hundred. Meanwhile, they started, you know, decades ago where you're just like, I, I just, I want to get there. But and that's a game I also put myself is like, what is there? You know what I mean? We, we kind of put an emphasis on the future so much that we forget to live in the now. Yeah. Well, the social media component is, is definitely something that I feel like we should talk about. It's, uh, it is really hard not to compare. And 
you know, you can see someone doing pull-ups. Meanwhile, out of the frame, their feet are on a box, right? Right. That could be hypothetical or real. Um, but we, yeah, we compare our chapter one to somebody else's chapter 20. Um, we look at other people, wish we have what they have, but we only see the good. We don't see the hard. And I think that just takes away from our ability, like you said, to be in the now and also to pursue the person that only we can become. And I think a lot of times we can get wrapped up in the, I should be doing this, or I want what that person has at the expense of what you could be doing or what your authentic potential looks like. And I'm curious for you, how you snap back out of that comparison when you catch yourself in it. Yeah. Um, honestly, it's just, it's one of those things that I just, after hearing my mind, I kind of just become aware of it. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, and especially one, the easiest person to do it with, I guess, is like a Nick Bear. So it's like, mm. it's how can you possibly compare that guy? First of all, he's, I don't know, probably 10 years older than me to begin with. And then it's, yeah, it's, it's just, it's easy to get caught up in, but at the same time, it's easy to become aware of it and just realize like, you're also seeing people's highlight reels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, Nick was episode 83 of this podcast and it was a cool experience to sit down with him for the second time is I also had him on the pursuit podcast when I was still doing that. And it, I don't know. I mean, you realize that people are just human and the conversation that I had with him was uh, hopefully him peeling back a layer for everybody who listened because we all, we all have our struggles and they all look different and hard is relative. And you know, what somebody is pursuing might not actually be meaningful to another person. And there's nothing wrong with looking at somebody and being inspired and maybe even using the way that they've done things as a blueprint to start to move in that direction. But I think people too often fall into the trap of, I don't even want to be like this person, but I want to be this person. And I think that's such a dangerous place to be. Uh, and I'm grateful for conversations like this because it just reminds me, it reminds you, it reminds people listening that we have to be who only we can be. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and another a good way to even look at it just kind of came to me as you were saying that is even marathons, right? So like, you know, people go out with specific time goals. Most people aren't trying to win that marathon. You're just trying to do your best. And that's kind of what it comes down to. And even within the marathon to, to further that example is, you know, there are different waves of the marathon and you might start in one wave and you might pass somebody else who is in a wave before you and somebody who started in a wave after you might pass you. But when you're in the mix, you have no idea who started when you have no idea who is ahead of you at the beginning or behind you at the beginning. And it's, it's easy to, again, look at somebody else and think, wow, they look so strong, or I can't believe that person passed me or whatever it is, but you don't know where somebody came from. You don't know where they're going and you don't even know why they're doing what they're doing. And I think that's also the power of conversation. And when we have conversations that peel back the layers where people can be vulnerable, you start to understand better why people do the things they do. And maybe it helps give us the perspective of, okay, that's why they're doing that. This is why I'm doing this. And both of those things are totally okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, so to, to transition to the other tough thing that you handled, and you've handled a lot of loss from what it sounds like, your cousin, right? Cousins, I should say, lost both of their parents a few years apart. And you watch that unfold uh, as a family member, as somebody who cares deeply about them. I mean, what is it like for you to process all of that? So one thing I think I did in the beginning, which was helpful and and not helpful to myself is I was, we were, were Italian, so very family oriented. And my, you could argue that I'm hundred percent Italian, though my last name is Kennedy. Um, but we, I was always really close to them. So when they lost their mom, I was sleeping there almost every weekend, playing video games, hanging out. And I kind of made it my job. Uh, my my personal internal job to make sure they were okay and at the same time it was kind of taking it off of myself with mm -hmm. dealing with the actual grief because I put such a mission on making sure they were okay that I kind of suppressed some stuff on my own that I I later had to deal with mm -hmm. when they lost their their mom that was your experience and then three years later did you handle that the same way uh, no, only because you had the, 
I, in a weird way, the luxury of we knew she was really sick. We knew there was a, a time frame. Um, everything with my uncle was I was, you know, we knew some financial things were going on that weren't in his, our family's best interest. And then I was woken up one morning at 5 a.m. telling me, like, we're going to our cousin's house. And I'm like, why? And then we're, my older sister picked me up from my college house at Monmouth. And was driving me there and, and kind of told me and I was like, wait, what? So it was like that whole day, I, I, I'll never forget it, but my I feel like my world was flipped upside down for sure. How does how does that experience, you know, both of those losses change you as a person? Does it soften you even more? Does it harden you? Does it change you in other ways? Yeah, I think honestly, it, it made me lean more into family than uh, than I've ever been. And that's kind of evolved now. Um, I was my cousins are, are basically my brothers. Um, and it, now it's even evolved that my sister has a, uh, she had her first baby and you would think, especially if you follow me on social media, you would think it's my child. <laughs> um, yeah, that mean family is so important and it's, it's cool to hear how loss can bring people closer together because it can also do, do the opposite. Um, and that's testament to you and your family. And so with that being said, then, those are some hard things that you didn't have a choice in the matter. What's the hardest thing that you've ever done on purpose? And again, why did you do that thing? Yeah, honestly, I would just say like self growth as a whole. Um, mm. It's sacrifice, you know, with that entails the physical events that I put myself through. And then for me, in the beginning was a lot of not even due to COVID, but just a lot of isolation. And it's a lot of saying no. Um, it, it's kind of keeping promises to yourself showing up and, and and just really doing the hard things when you know the easy thing is obviously convenient and, and comfortable yeah so i'll share a little bit of a story and then i want us to dive a little bit deeper into this because i think it's very valuable but when i was a freshman in college i decided to give up alcohol and so I realized I used to keep track of it, you know, one year, two years, three years. I was really proud of it and still am. And this January, 2023 was actually 10 years. And I forgot about it uh, until after the fact, uh, because at this point, it's just part of who I am. It's, it's, I don't, I don't do that. That's not my identity and I don't miss it at all. But at the time in 2013, when I stopped, I was a freshman in college. Uh, I was surrounded by people who were drinking multiple times a week and a lot of alcohol. And I had built my initial friendships at college in that setting. And so to give up alcohol was to give up a lot of those friendships. And instead of going out on Friday night, I was at the library. And instead of partying on Saturday night, I was in the gym and I was that person who was just isolated physically, mentally, emotionally. I felt so alone. And, uh, one one side of me really hated that. One side of me wished that I was still drinking and still around those people and making that easy choice to just have friends by default. Uh, and the other part of me, which was smaller at the time, but has since grown, was really proud of myself and was really happy with the fact that I was the only one in the library at 11 p.m. on a Friday and the only one in the gym at 12 p.m. or 12 a.m. on Saturday. And I look back and I'm so glad I stayed the course because that time of solitude helped me realize who I was and who I didn't want to be. And slowly over time, after I got rid of that initial uh, group of people who I met through alcohol, uh, if you can say that, I guess, I slowly had people walk into my life who were about what I was about and who wanted the things that I wanted. And that group has grown over time. And I would consider anybody in the Project Endure community part of that circle now. And it's just really reaffirming to know that there are other people out there who want those things, who want to work hard, who want to be better, and who are willing to sacrifice for it like yourself. And so I share all that because I know there are people out there who are in seasons of life right now where they feel so alone and the temptation to just go back to what's easiest just to be around people again is strong. And uh, in my my case, I'm glad I didn't do that. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that and, and we can dive deep. Yeah, no, I, I totally, totally agree. And it, go, it goes back to delayed gratification, really. Where and, and obviously you saw it pay off. 
Yeah. Are you familiar with the marshmallow experiment? I've heard of it. I think maybe I've heard yeah. speak about it. Yeah. So it was a Stanford study a uh, long time ago uh, in the 1970s, 80s, maybe 90s, but maybe 70s or 80s. Anyway, they had these kids come into the research lab and they'd sit down at a table and the researcher would put a marshmallow on the table in front of them and say, you can eat this now, but I'm going to leave and come back in five minutes. If it's still here in five minutes, you can have two marshmallows. And then they let the kids do whatever they were going to do. And some of them ate the first marshmallow and some of them waited for five minutes and got a second marshmallow. And then they followed these kids as they became teenagers and young adults and adults. And they measured all of these things. You know, How did they do in school? How much money were they making? Uh, how did they rate their levels of happiness and fulfillment? And they found that the ability to delay gratification with the marshmallow as a child correlated with more money, better grades. A uh, better rating of relationships, more happiness and fulfillment. And it's such an important skill. And I would call it a skill because I think a lot of people going back to the narratives don't have it or feel like they don't have it. And then they just tell themselves that story like, oh, I can't resist junk food or, oh, I don't work out or oh, I don't get up early. And that becomes who they are because that's a story they tell themselves. Yeah, no, absolutely. The this, this self-talk has such power. And so you've clearly changed your self-talk over the years. Yeah. What what did you what did you do? How did you do it? Because it's possible, you know? Absolutely. Um honestly, COVID, I think COVID was a blessing for a lot of people, whether they realize it or not. Um, and I obviously I couldn't be around groups of people that were on the in the like self-growth entrepreneur space, but we have social media. And even if you go on my feed today, like it's it's just quotes, it's just like a lot of nutrition stuff, but then it's a lot of motivational. And again, I think there is a form of positive toxicity that, that people talk about all the time. But at the same time, if you're in a bad place, why not just change the narrative and just see what happens? Um, and it's kind of what I did. I, I found a lot of podcasts, a lot of uh, just role models, good leaders, and, uh, and just kind of took in all that information for, for months. Mm. Yeah, there's something to be said for diet being more than just the food that we eat and social media can you know bring you down but it can also serve a really positive uh purpose in life you can surround yourself with people that you otherwise wouldn't have access to you can consume content with intention that's going to lift you up and encourage you and inspire you and i know you and i both share a love of quotes uh, and i'm curious if you have any quotes that you'd like to share because uh, I'm usually the one doing the quote sharing here on the podcast, but what do you think? Uh, nothing at the moment, but definitely some will come. I've I've got one for you then. Yeah, uh, I think this this speaks to um, the importance of not only consuming positive content, encouraging content, etc., but then taking action on it. And so this is from Neil Gaiman, who said, "I hope that in this year to come, you make mistakes." Because if you're making mistakes, then you're making new things, trying new things, learning, living, pushing yourself, changing yourself, changing your world. You're doing things you've never done before. And more importantly, you're doing something. And I think the, the piece that I would add to you need to surround yourself with all of these good things and all of these uplifting things is, and then you also need to put that back out into the world. You also have to put one foot in front of the other. You have to not only think it would be a good idea to change your narrative, you actually have to implement that and change your narrative. And by doing, we can become. And uh, it's just really powerful to hear stories like people um, uh, like yourself who are actually doing that, who are changing their narrative, changing their life, changing the world. Uh, so I appreciate that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Man. And you're a living example of this as well. Thanks, man. It's, you know what? I honestly can't imagine my life any other way. It's, it's weird to think that at one point in time, I didn't wake up every morning at, you know, 334 and I didn't, you know, work out every single day with intention and purpose or that I didn't have conversations like this. I, I, I look back and I wish I started all of this so much earlier, which makes me wonder what would it have taken for my younger self? to realize that this was the path I wanted to be on sooner. Uh, and I'm not sure if you ever think about that looking back, you know, how could I have started this journey five years ago, 10 years ago? What, what spark would I have needed? Yeah, 
no absolutely and it's it's actually funny so all of this really kicked off in 2020 but a lot of it was just focused on the physical as far as like i wanted to be lean i wanted a six pack i wanted to do david goggins four by four by 48 like i i did a string of just ridiculous athletic i guess achievements um within six months of each other and I was growing mentally, but it really was just so much focused on the physical. Um, and it, it's funny because of that, I dove in, into mortgages um, and the world opened back up, back up and, you know, drinking was a possibility again. And what do you do when you, you know, you need to network, everybody drinks. So I fell right back into that for a summer. And then coming out of that summer, I went into a bodybuilding prep and I haven't looked back since and and I won't. Yeah. And to circle back to what you brought up in the beginning, you know, physical pursuits can and often do open up the door to mental and emotional and even spiritual growth. And one of the reasons I started taking cold showers probably six plus years ago now was because I saw the potential to change from a mental standpoint, a mindset standpoint, not a physical, you know, there are physical benefits to being exposed to cold water, but I was in it for the mental. And I think a lot of times when things stay in our minds, they're a bit abstract. It's hard to make a change when you're just thinking about that change, but to then take it a step further and say, I'm going to put my body through this experience where it's going to hit a barrier and my mind is going to say, I want to stop, but I can use my body as the vehicle to say, no, I'm going to keep going is incredibly powerful. And I look at all the people in the world who pursue comfort, who look at a marathon or the gym and they say, why would I ever do that? Because that's uncomfortable. And I feel so sad because they are missing that gateway to all of that growth that you and I both know very well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it, it's funny you say that I had a friend, um, actually say to me when like all this was, all the change was originally going on. He's like, you're, uh, you're changing so much. I don't like it. And mm. it, it's always stuck in my head. And I'm like, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to evolve. You know what? I, I recorded an episode with Frankie Dades. I want to say it's episode 20 off the top of my head. And him and I talked about what happens when you change and the people around you don't change. And it's really hard to realize that you're changing and heading down a path that the people that you call friends, used to call friends, want to call friends are not changing with you. And maybe they're staying at a place where you really don't want to be. And it's hard to leave people behind, but sometimes that is what needs to happen. And it doesn't have to be, I'm going to leave this person in, in the dust and never talk to them again, but it might look like, hey, instead of going out and drinking with this person three times a week, uh, I might connect with them once every other month uh, for a cup of coffee or for a run or a walk or whatever it is. And that transition can be really hard. And I will say, I think the people that truly care about us will understand our change um, in due time, meaning they might not understand it in the moment, but if you tr stay true to yourself and you stay true to that path, eventually the people who matter, they'll come back and they'll understand why you were doing what you did. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. And, and like you said, I mean, you cut out alcohol. I cut out, I was like really, really into the NFL and just sports in general. Um, I, I, I don't think for like four years there, I missed a single touchdown in the NFL, which is crazy to say, but you know, you cut those things out and, and people just feel like they can't connect to you. And I never maliciously would cut anybody out of my life, but it kind of, yeah, relationships definitely just kind of fall to the wayside because of, of interest. Yeah. And I think people come into our life for, for certain seasons and reasons, and they leave for the same thing. And I'm not, saying because i don't know uh that this is the case with the people around you and it may or may not be the case for people listening but sometimes if you're making a really positive change in your life and you're around people who see that change but don't want to make that change for themselves they might feel bad they might say oh man vin is really he's getting into shape he's not drinking as much he's motivated he's driven and i don't really want to do any of the things he's doing, but it almost feels like I should be, maybe that's a reason why they might want to distance themselves from you. And uh, that's a reality that we have to be okay with as well when we're pursuing our best self. Yeah, no, absolutely. 
Uh, so Vin, let me ask you this. You obviously care a lot about endurance, your podcast, keep going one foot in front of the other. You've pursued a ton in the physical world and you're pursuing your best self every day in the here and now. What does the word endurance mean to you? It's a resiliency, just having kind of having that, that mental fortitude to just keep going and pushing through. Mm. So in the physical world, let's talk about maybe a time where you had to tap into endurance, where you had to be resilient. Uh, I know obviously we have a a couple things to pick from, but does anything come to mind where you really had to tap into that? Yeah, honestly, I would. So in my freshman year of college, I was 250 pounds. Yeah. How, wait a second. How we're like we're like over halfway into this podcast, and you haven't mentioned that yet. How is this just coming up now? Yeah, uh, I it's it's something that honestly I, I I try and be as open about it as possible, but it's it's just another time where it was like, you know, food and alcohol was getting the best of me. Um, but back to the question, it was uh, I went to I was like I need to lose weight. Actually, uh, an ex girlfriend made a comment. Uh, we were we were dating at the time, and it wasn't even hurtful. It wasn't even malicious. It's just the way I took it. And, you know, it was just a, a reality check, really. Um, but I was like, you know what? I'm getting in shape. I'm going to run. I'm going to run a mile. Went to a track. First of all, I had to Google how many laps around a track was a mile, which was a little sad for me at the time. Um, but I saw it was four. And I went to go run one lap around the track. And I was absolutely gassed. Um, so I quit. And I was like, you know what? Maybe this isn't for me. This is tough. And the next day it came down to like, you know, get my normal, like 12 inch Buffalo chicken sub or a salad. I was like, let me just get the salad. Let's see what happens. And then that night I, when I walked, I was walking to the track again and I saw bleachers and I was like, you know what, let me just, maybe that's easier. So that's what I did. I did it for honestly, probably months until I was running like a hundred bleachers straight. And I was like, maybe I could run a mile now. And then sure enough, I was able to run a mile. So I would say that because pushing through in the beginning when there's no proof, there's, there was no proof in the pudding. There was no, I wasn't even really seeing much change initially, though I had a ton of, uh, fat to shed it, you know, it took a little bit. It was just the consistency, but yeah, I would definitely say in that moment. That brings up, a, I think a bigger question in my mind, not necessarily for you, but for all of us is endurance kind of requires a certain level of trust or faith, or, you know, there's gotta be something worth, worth this on the other side, like to keep going, there has to be something worth it. And when you don't have proof of that, right. Why keep going? Right. And that, that is an open-ended question that I hope people listening will think about for themselves, but for you, you know, why, why did you keep going? Why did you try? Cause you didn't have any proof at the time. Why not stop? I just, I knew I could be more. I think I just knew, I knew there was more levels I needed to get to. And the path I was going down was just not a bright one. Mm. So being more for you, what is that all about? Because I think it means different things to different people, but I don't think it could be just for us. Right. Cause at the end of the day, there are going to be so many obstacles put in our path that are so much bigger than just us as individuals. And to keep going, I think we need a reason why that's bigger than us. So why do you care about being more? Because it can't just be for you, right? Yeah, No, absolutely not. So, and that's kind of, again, goes back to like the manner in which I live my life. I, I have a really close relationship with my little sister. And so her directly, I see it all the time. Like we just ran a marathon together in Mesa, Arizona, which was so cool um as she saw me run one a couple of months back and she wanted to give it a try also i you know kept kind of pushing it but she she did want to do it and uh and so it's just that it's it's just seeing the people around me grow and get positively impact in kind of almost the same manner in which when i was taking in the podcast and taking in the positive you know motivational stuff listen to a lot of goggins and, and guys like that and just seeing the changes um and it was actually so cool. I think it was last week. Um, a buddy of mine that I worked with at a restaurant when I was when I was younger um, just made a huge. I think he dropped like eighty pounds. Same thing. And he's like, "Yeah, I just want to let you like you reached out out of the blue. It was like, hey, I want to let you know, like I see everything posting. Like it was actually like an advocate and kind of helped. And just to be like any glimmer of light in that is like 
you know, I don't care if I have one follower or a million, it's, it's just cool to impact people. Uh, I couldn't agree more with that. And, you know, I think again, another reason why I love social media is because things like that can happen and you can put something up and you don't know who's looking at it, but there's a chance that somebody's looking at it and is being impacted by it, hopefully in a positive way. And uh, it's really special when those kind of things happen and they don't happen often or all the time, but we choose to keep going and to be consistent and to be persistent and uh, just to circle back real quick before we put a bow on this part of the conversation, the topic of resilience is one that I love. There's a quote that, get where I saw it, I'm not exactly sure who said it, it's not me, but resilience is endurance with direction. And I think endurance is incredibly important, but endurance without purpose to me is exhaustion. It's, you know, you can run in circles your whole life. And that's endurance in a way, if you don't stop and you keep going, but really, where does that get you? And so what is the direction that we're applying this endurance? And if you can continue in that direction over a long period of time, despite obstacles and setbacks, to me, that's resilience. And resilience, I think, uh, implies a certain level of strength. Uh, it, you know, you're stronger because you've endured. And I'm curious for you, what is the ultimate direction? That you're applying this endurance and it's also okay if you don't know because i don't i don't think most of us do i would yeah i would just say self-growth as a whole and kind of wherever that evolution takes me and, I, and i'm kind of open to the change of all of it yeah so then as we near the end of this conversation a lot of people listening to this are scattered across the country even outside of the country all different seasons of life going through different things uh, maybe some people are dissatisfied with where they're at uh, in their career. Maybe some people are looking to change their circle, uh, the people that they're surrounded by. Maybe some people are on month five of being stuck in their room outside of doctor's appointments because they just can't muster up the courage or the energy or the, the enthusiasm to go outside. And you get to speak to those people for however long you want. You get to say whatever you want. What do you say to them? Yeah, I would, I would kind of say one thing that we touched on is is like, of course, do it for you, but do it for other people as well, because you really don't know who you're impacting. And just it, it goes back to the theme of what it seems like this episode was all about. It's just the the narrative that you tell yourself is so powerful and it could it could help you or it could really hurt you. Yeah, we we are the stories that we tell ourselves and. Van, I really appreciate your story and for you sharing it here. Uh, if people want to reach out, if people want to follow along, if people want to just connect and, and say thank you, where's the best place for people to do that? Probably Instagram, uh, vkennedy18. Awesome. Well, Van, I appreciate you a ton. Uh, I had a lot of fun with this one, and I know it's going to be valuable for the people listening. So thank you, man. Yeah, thank you, brother. Appreciate your time. If you enjoyed this episode of the Project Indoor podcast, go ahead and subscribe, leave a review on your platform of choice, and share this episode with a friend. It helps us get more conversations like this out to more people like you. We appreciate you, and we'll talk to you next time. And one more thing. If you're looking for a community of people all striving to be better together, check out the Project Indoor Hard Things Club. The link is in the description below. We'd love to have you.